So most of these workplaces, um, if they know they are having um, exposure to lead, um, some of them have a lead program, uh, but it's, it's very likely that it doesn't maybe go beyond that um, because these are often small to medium workplaces. And so they wouldn't have very large health and safety programs, although they do. Um, and so to answer that question, um, I would need to answer more from the research perspective uh, because uh, a lot of the work that I've done has been more about understanding what are the exposures in these workplaces. Um, and so if we're thinking about research in terms of assessing hazards, um, uh, then, then um, I've done all kinds of uh, sampling from air sampling to um, blood, urine, um, dermal sampling. Um, I have also done dust sampling and um, everything to determine potential routes of exposure and potential con different contaminants. So, um, so it, it just depends on, on the question and the type of facility that you're tackling because different facilities um, have an emphasis on processing different materials and depending on those materials, then you can prioritize what exposure assessment you would do. There can be high exposures. Um, I wouldn't say that is the type of workplaces where very high exposures are very common. Um, they're high enough to be of uh, health concern, uh, but what happens in many of these workplaces is that they're not always high um, because there's just so much variability in the influx of materials that are being processed. Um, and so that actually makes it a little more challenging for compliance and understanding what maybe PPE is required or what controls are required. Um, and so unfortunately it's, it's very common to see, you know, shredders without any controls um, on ventilation or extraction of the dust or other controls because it's not always high, um, but it can be very high depending on what is being processed. Um, and they're definitely high enough to be a health concern. In these workplaces, um, most often um, hierarchy of controls is easy to apply, uh, but in terms of, um, you know, I guess every, every case would be different, but in terms of substitution or elimination, um, in some cases, for example, when uh, facilities don't process um, cathode ray tubes from the old television or old computers, uh, we would suggest that they may just not take them at all. Many of them uh, take them because when they're sorting, they would take the yolk out, which is a copper wire that is actually pays very good price. Um, but then when you break the seal, on the cathode ray tube, you can release a lot of dust that could have likely lead and cadmium and other and phosphorus and other things. And so in that case, the best is actually not to receive cathode ray tubes if you don't have a lead program, if you're not really prepared to deal with that uh, type of contaminant. Um, and that way you avoid having those uh, materials in your site. Uh, in terms of controls, uh, you can always install engineering controls such as ventilation, local exhaust ventilation, barriers uh, from different sections of the site so that the shredder is isolated to other parts of the facility. Um, and this is sometimes hard because many of these facilities work in these big warehouses. Many, many times the warehouses are rented. Uh, and so it's not always as easy or as feasible. Um, but then if you can at least uh, put some materials to isolate the shredder a little bit more, even if you don't have a wall, uh, then that alone would be actually um, much, much better for both noise and dust. 
And then um, obviously administrative controls are important because if you know that there's certain sites of the facility that have higher exposures, then um, you want to prioritize, you know, some of your programs in that area, but not forgetting the other ones. Um, maybe, you know, understanding how rotation of shifts or management of the hours uh, would impact exposures um, so that you can manage them properly. Um, and then in particular, if you have a lead program, um, administrative controls are super important to understand, to, to make sure that the lead is not spreading throughout the whole facility or is not actually leaving the work site uh, by facilitating good washing facilities and keeping um, clean areas clean. Um, and then finally, personal protective equipment. I think with uh, the pandemic, we have now grown, or at least most people have grown um, painfully aware of how important personal protective is. Um, and in these workplaces, it's very common to see um, voluntary use of respirators, uh, gloves, um, <clears throat> sleeves uh, for cut resistance, uh, for heat, um, goggles, um, steel toed boots, uniforms. There's uh, a wide variety of uh, personal protective equipment, but um, the smaller the work site, um, sometimes they don't have as much or as available personal protective equipment. So basically the uh, facility puts a small shredder in a, you know, in a, in a semi truck um, in the back um, and they go to a site and it's actually designed for highly classified uh, information. So for example, in a hospital or a government agency, that wants to destroy cell phones or hard drives and they want a strict chain of command, then they can actually watch these um, materials being destroyed on site and they don't have to, you know, be concerned that any information is going to be leaked or uh, go out of the facility. So these uh, tracks are, are, have become very popular uh, and sometimes a company can have several tracks that go even to many different states. Um, and sometimes a track can do a two hour job, but it can also do a whole week um, job and uh, often parks in the parking lot of, of a hospital and, and just shreds away. So some of the advantages is really more on data security and convenience for, for clients. Um, and it also gives, um, you know, e-waste um, recycling the facility to actually shred more things and, and make, you know, it increase the rate of uh, recycling actually. So it, in, in, in principle is, is a great idea. So some disadvantages is that, um, these, these tracks were not actually designed to, to hold a, a shredder in the back. And so there's a lot of engineering uh, challenges in terms of no ventilation whatsoever. And these tracks sometimes are very long. And so even if you have the, the back open, there's really not enough ventilation to be helping. Um, and some of these shredders are actually closed boxes, which helps uh, keep the dust in but uh, some of the shredders are semi-open or open. Uh, and if you don't have an, um, you know, um, ventilation or extractor uh, in the truck, it can really be an issue. Uh, and even if you have some, some of that, you would have to also do it right, right so that you're not contaminating the truck in other areas or the air outside of the truck and you're still there. <laughs> Um, but there's also a lot of safety issues in terms of getting stuck inside the truck or getting caught in the truck. Um, you know, usually they go in pairs to work, but if they were to send one person, there could also be a lot of safety issues associated with these trucks. Um, they're not going to have a bathroom. So unless they're, um, 
you know, working with a facility that uh, helps them clean up and, um, and, and deal with that hygiene aspect of the work. Um, it may work, although it's not so ideal. Um, but especially if they're um, shredding hard drives and things that could potentially have some lead, um, it becomes a little more critical that, um, that these workers have a way to clean up and, and do a lot of things before they even drive back to their hotels or where they're staying. And health effects, uh, we really don't know enough. Um, you know, I, I did some exposure characterization, but it was, it was really meant to be a pilot study so that we do some more um, studies in the future, hopefully. But I would presume the health effects are going to be very similar to the recyclers uh, on facilities. I think um, there's several certifications um, that manage uh, this industry, and they've been absolutely incredible in terms of adding a lot of uh, resources uh, to these facilities and how to improve health and safety. And um, there's been some OSHA consultation and other programs that have put emphasis uh, on this industry and provided a lot of support. Uh, so I, I do think that a lot of good things are happening. And um, I think that there's a lot of interest in this industry and there's been a lot of work that has been done to, to elevate um, you know, the, the work conditions. Uh, but these are still many of them small, medium businesses, and they will just continue to have the challenges that uh, businesses of this size have in terms of dealing with challenging health and safety conditions, like in the case of uh, e-waste, uh, because, um, you know, uh, there can be new elements that are being added to electronics and things that are going to be coming up in the waste um, that maybe we were not prepared before or, or ready to address. Um, and so they, they just have to be very vigilant to be able to address us as these issues come up. Um, and there's some companies now that are exploring robotics and that's definitely gonna be probably displaced in some of the most high hazard jobs, um, which is, good in terms of exposures, uh, it can create other issues in terms of social display, displacement and other things. But uh, in terms of exposures and high hazard, um, uh, it, it can definitely be uh, helping um, decrease uh, some of these exposures um, in the future as more facilities um, do these. I do think that um, certifications are actually working internationally now. And there's a lot of push even from developing countries into really organizing and pushing things in the right direction um, to improve health and safety. Uh, there's a long, long way to go. Um, but, but it's encouraging to see things really pushing in the right direction. Um, but, but it's going to take some time.